Won't you bow your heads with me in prayer? Eternal God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the praise that has lifted us to the doorway of heaven. We thank you for the unction of the Holy Spirit that has transported us up and beyond our earthboundness and allowed us, God, to peer into the night yet as if it is now to sit in the heavenlies, God, and to incline our ears to hear what thus saith the Lord. So, God, we pray that your voice leap from beneath the pages of the text and empower us for the living of our faith in these difficult days. God, we pray that everything that obstructs our hearing and blinds our eyes and we cannot see your revelations and your truth in anything, oh God, that has arrested and seized and choked off our affection so we cannot love you first and foremost, that you bind it right now, right now, God, that we might continue to be impressionable clay in the hands of a potter ever shaping and molding us after your will. While we are waiting, yielded and still. This is our prayer, God, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Let every heart say together, Amen. Amen. Won't you stand to your feet all over the building? Stand to your feet. And I want to turn your attention to 1 Corinthians. And I'm going to read the first uh, three verses, but really emphasis upon the first two verses. 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians. And 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. So we'll take a left. If you're in the Old Testament, please make sure you sign up for all the Bible study courses we have in the fall. Amen. So we can get your biblical GPS set correctly. Say amen, somebody. Amen. Somebody around you is still turning their pages. Just whisper to them, Bible study. <laughs> Don't say it out loud. Don't be rude. Don't be rude. Amen. Just uh, whisper. Amen. Paul called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes to the church of God in Corinth to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be holy together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, emphasis upon verses 1 and 2. Paul called to be an apostle of Christ by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes to the church of God in Corinth to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be holy together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ their Lord and ours the scripture as is written and may God add a blessing to the reading and the hearing of his most holy word. You may be seated in the presence of God and each other. And as you take your seat, you know the drill. Reach out and take somebody by the hand, particularly someone who looks like they don't want to be bothered. It just don't make no sense to go to some place where there's going to be a bunch of people when you don't want to be bothered. And uh, say to them, neighbor, what is your calling very straightforward very straightforward now look at somebody else say to them friend what is your calling now put your finger in your chest and say self do we know what is our calling my subject this morning is very straightforward it's a question it's an interrogative what is your calling what is your calling? My sister Felicia, who, um, she's ambitious. She's five foot. She'll swear that she's five two. And uh, it's her dream. She can make it a big one. Um, 
long time ago, she, she, you know, they talk about for men the, um, uh, the little man's disease, the Napoleon complex. My sister Felicia has the Jada Pinkett complex. The <laughs> little women who realize that the biggest thing about them is their mouth, and as children, she learned to weaponize it with skillfulness. And she, early in her young adult years, she's always been hard on service people, um, waiters, waitresses, doormen, um, people who, in her mind, because they're supposed to serve her, she can be, in my opinion, unfairly demanding of them. And she was visiting here in Seattle once, and we were downtown at a restaurant, and the fork on the table had some water spots. For me, it's an issue you can resolve with your sleeve. Um, her being a type A black female, I uh, thought that this was an issue that um, required the calling of one's manager. And uh, I was more of the opinion, can't we all just get along? And, um, so she told the uh, waitress who had the unmitigated gall to put a fork in front of her that had a water spot on it. And uh, when the lady rolled her eyes and went and brought her a new fork, instead of laying it down neatly, she kind of slapped it down, not realizing the um, <laughs> person she was dealing with. And uh, Mrs. Felicia summarily, before I could reach out and grab her, jumped up and barked out, so what is your purpose in life? and I want to speak to your manager. Now, the question she asked, what is your purpose in life? It was said flippantly, sarcastically. It was intended to lacerate the psyche and the soul. It was intended to shrink and crush and obliterate all at once. It was the weaponizing of the tongue. Um, and, uh, but ironically, those words, while in that situation was intended to do harm, is probably the most salient question you can put before most of us who claim attachment and affinity to the cross of Jesus Christ. What is your purpose in life? Or better yet, what is your calling? I, I, I was watching closely the debate that unfolded this past week when None other than Jay-Z um, struck a deal with the NFL, NFL to uh, combine music and social justice, um, uh, social justice agenda. And many persons uh, were not feeling that throughout the black community. And others, it felt like Jay-Z, the ultimate businessman, who's got serious social justice bona fides, but the businessman in him was trumping the social justice consciousness because he was coming in and uh, striking a deal that would make a billionaire already richer, even more rich, um, and that he was capitalizing on a situation without bringing justice to cap, in terms of Colin Kaepernick, and, um, and felt that he was given the NFL the ultimate cover on the social justice issue when he said we are beyond kneeling so he was undercutting uh, those players who for sake of consciousness wanted to uh, use the NFL as a platform to bring attention uh, to the backward uh, movement on social justice issues and um, that he was given the NFL an opportunity to take the issue off the table um, and that he was simply enriching himself further, selling out his previous social justice conscious for the sake of making more millions. And a raging debate to this moment uh, goes on. My position on as I paste, post it on my Facebook, well, let's give it a chance. Let's give it a chance and see where it goes because I think he has earned the benefit of the doubt. There's some doubt, but give him the benefit of it and let's see it and let's judge it on its merits. But one thing that Jay-Z said in an interview that I think is worthy of our um, recognition this morning, he said, in terms of Kaepernick, he said, we've been trying to get him a job. And he says, and in reality, he's become a social icon. He had a job. Now he's a social icon. And what's better, a job or a calling? And, and whatever Jay-Z's motivations are, it presses the salient question 
Some people just look for a job in life. But is that the end in life just to get a job? A job at best is simply a source of making a living. But a calling is about why you were made to live. And when saints of God who affix themselves and their eternal hopes to the cross aspire no more than to make a living, but don't discover why they were made to live, then at the end of our life we realize that while our life is over, we never really lived it for any purpose for which we were truly called. And so let me start by saying, in terms of a calling, my brothers and sisters, a calling is not what you do, it's who you are. I'm going to give you five points and get out your way. A calling is not what you do, it's who you are. And thus we hear the Apostle Paul to the Corinthian church, one of the largest cities in the Roman Empire. Where Paul introduces himself, he says, I, Paul, call to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes. I, Paul, called to be an apostle. And um, he goes on to say, uh, to the church of God in Corinth, in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be holy together with all those everywhere who call in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and their Lord and Savior. He says, I'm called and you guys are called. And there is a word there, kletos, which means to be called. It's, 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 its simplest meaning is someone who's received an invitation. If I had a function and I sent you an invitation, you have been called. You've been summonsed. You've been asked to appear. I, Paul, called to be an apostle by the will of, of Christ Jesus. And... Paul, when he reached the Roman church, Sam, he says, Paul, and then he says, a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, a doulos, a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, he says, and called to be an apostle. So against Kletos, I received an invitation. And so if you want to know, and, and, and as an apostle, I have certain duties. Apostles were, when someone hung out a shingle and said they were, they were a church, they would dispatch apostles from the mother church in Jerusalem to go and check it out and certify that these were, uh, in fact, legitimate followers of Jesus Christ. And in so doing, they would conscript them back into the universal church of Jesus Christ. That was their form of quality controls in those days. Just because you say you're a church, we're not necessarily going to recognize you as a church. You have to prove that you will suffer for Jesus and prove that you will take care of one another. Because how can you say you love God whom you've never seen and hate your brother and sister whom you see every day? And how can you say that you're a follower of the crucified Lord when you're not willing to bear your cross? So that was the twofold matter test of whether or not this is a legitimate ministry and you're a legitimate disciple of Jesus Christ. Um, are you willing to uh, suffer for Jesus? Because if every time somebody sits in your seat when you're a half hour late, you suddenly feel like you ain't getting fed here and you got to go to another church. We, we're questioning your testimony. And, 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 and if you have no empathy for anybody, you just want what you want. You think Christianity is a genie lamp if you rub it just right. All the things you aspire in your adult toys. So Jesus is sitting with a cosmic bellhop, but your brother and sister who's hungry, and, uh, but you never offer them food, and they're, they're naked, you never offer them clothes. And you're saying you love God, but you don't seem to care much about anybody around you, that your testimony in the eyes of others will really be more like a testimony. Because your vertical proclamation is being defied and exposed as not authentic by your horizontal commitments. You ain't putting no skin in the game and you ain't doing for nobody but yourself. Right. Touch your neighbor and say, that's trifling. That, that's, that, that's trifling. And so in his apostolic capacity, apostles went out and they spread the gospel and certified local manifestations of the universal body of Jesus Christ by seeing if people really were putting skin in the game and really caring about others. Because by that, they would know that you are our disciples. And so Paul, in terms of, and, and so those were the duties, but the duties flew out of the identity the duties, doing is a function of thinking. So the duties flow out of the identity. If you want to know why he did what he did in preaching and teaching and traveling and serving, 
it was because of who he was. I am an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, the old saying says, some are called, some are sent, and some just went. Don't think I put my hand on myself and baptized myself and called myself. He says, I was called and then sent. Apostle means sent one, but I was called. I received an invitation. I do what I do because of what I am. I am an apostle by the will of God. That's what I am. I have a calling. I've been called. I received an invitation, a summons from heaven. And the Roman church in Romans 8 and 28, he says, uh, all things work together for them that love the Lord and are called, Kletos, that are called according to his service. And whom he did for, no, he did predestinate. Whom he did predestinate, he did call. And whom he did call, he did justify. And when he gets down to 8 and 30, when he says whom he did call, he did justify. And whom he did justify, he did glorify. When he says call in the second instance, he uses a word, uh, uh, klesos. And, um, and that word means that those who accepted the invitation and showed up. So you invited me to your party, but oftentimes you invite people to a party and they don't show up. So in Matthew, when he tells the story of the laborers and Matthew 20 and 16, and then he tells the story of the wedding feast where many didn't show up. And then one person showed up and they weren't properly dressed, which offended the host because some people don't show up at all. And some people show up in such a way that shows that you have no respect for what you have been invited to. Some people won't even come to the body of Christ and hear the gospel. And some people have come to church and still with a football game on their mind. So they come, but they don't show up right. So you've been called, you've been received an invitation. You either it blew it off or you showed up as if you didn't understand what the occasion, the event was all about. So you showed up and offended the host. But then there are those who received an invitation and responded to the invitation and have showed up and showed up right. And so the kletos are those who received an invitation and the ekletos, which is the root of the word from ecclesia, which meant the church, the chosen ones. When it says many are called in Matthew 20 and 16 and then 22 and 14 twice, he says many are called, but few are chosen. It means many got their invitation, but few received it and showed up right. That's all they're trying to say. That some people won't even come to church and other people come to church with something other than God on their mind, which offends God. He wants us to show up and show up right. And Paul says that uh, to the church in Corinth, the church where his apostolic bona fides are being questioned because in their mind, in their definition, an apostle was one of those, the 12 who walked with Jesus. So is Peter and his brother Andrew, is James and John, the sons of Zebedee, the other James, the son of Alphaeus and, and Matthew and, and Nathaniel and, uh, and Didymus and, 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 and Thomas Didymus and, and Simon the Zealot and, um, and Bartholomew and, and Jude and even Judas Iscariot who killed himself that these were those who bona fidely could call the apostle because they literally walked with Jesus who then said, go ye into all the earth. And Paul was not among them. Paul said, no, I was not among them. I was not in the upper room. I did not walk with him prior to his death and resurrection. Oh, but on that road to Damascus one day, that same one slapped me off my beast when I was on a mission of mayhem, like on an Allstate commercial. Uh, and he arrested me, took away my physical sight long enough to give me insight and then through uh, Ananias told me that I was chosen, called to be an apostle to the Gentiles and their kings and to the children of Israel. So I received my invitation on the Damascus road. I, I, I received my invitation and I received it and I accepted it and I showed up. That's who I am. If you want to know who I am, I am somebody who received an invitation from God to do what I do. Do. It's not a job for me. It was not a career decision. It was not an assessment of where I could command the highest salary. It was not a well worked out career path. It, it, it did not have the highest professional trajectory and the best benefit plan. It was a sense of, it was not a, 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 a source of, of making a living. It was an understanding of why I was made to live. Sometimes we confuse making a living with a life that makes a difference. And that's why so many people hate their job because it's just a job. 
And as long as it's just a job, you probably will hate it. A job can give you a source of income, but it can't give you meaning. It can't give you a sense of fulfillment. It can't give you a sense of this is worth my while. And some of you are going to go to a job you hate tomorrow, even if it gives you good money, but don't give you a good feeling. Because in spite of the money, you still don't have any sense of why you were made to live in the first place. Paul had a calling. And to think about a calling, point number two, is that oftentimes you don't choose it, it chooses you. <laughs> Let me take a repass on that. A calling, you don't choose it. It chooses you. It's, it's not a rational process where I think A, B, C, mm, this would be a good one. It's more of a sense of I've been arrested. As they call the Zeke geese, the spirit of the time has tracked me down. And despite what I might have otherwise wanted to do or decided to do, I've been arrested. And now I have a sense of the can't help it. Dr. Uh, Juanita Thomas, who... I want to hunter who preached the uh, commencement sermon at my graduation from the United Theological Seminary uh, in 1996, raised a Presbyterian as they, at a time when they were not ordaining Presbyterian women, received a call and people wanted to know why she was a Baptist because since they didn't acknowledge the calling of women to preach, she found herself in the Baptist church. Um, because she was called by the will of God. And people say, what made you decide to go into ministry? She said, I didn't make a choice. A choice made me. And when, in 2017, it was the 500-year anniversary of what we call the Protestant Reformation, when a 31-year-old monk named Martin Luther teaching theology at the University of Wittenberg tacked 95 theses, 95 complaints on the door of the Castle Church in Wittenberg. And it started what we today refer to as the Protestant Reformation, now 502 years old, out of which the Baptist Church in 1612 and others would come, other denominations would come to pass. And Martin Luther was not trying to start a movement. He could have in no ways imagined that. He simply had some complaints against the Catholic Church of which he was a part, a son of, born and bred in. And his chief complaint was what they called indulgences, where priests who would pronounce absolution on saints of God when they had sinned and then gone through the, the sacrament of confession and all of that. And if you made good money, um, the priest would pronounce absolution of your sins for a nice check. And poor people, oftentimes their sins would not be absolved. They might have to do 2,000 Hail Marys, run around the church, do some push-ups and all that kind of stuff. But if you could just write a check, the priests who were pronounce your sins forgiven. So absolution came for a price. And Martin Luther had enough sense that the grace of God should not be sold. It should not be monetized. And among his 95 complaints, the chiefest of which is that the grace of God is free. And so when he put those, those, those 95 theses on the door of the Castle Church in Wittenberg, it was not like no one ever complained about that before. But in, in the Kairos moment, where, it, where, where meaningless linear chronos time meets with the intersection of divine purpose, and this time when the complaint was raised, all the events of history had stacked up just right where it started a wildfire. And Protestantism was born. And oftentimes people, Martin Luther was simply doing what he felt he was called to do. And for this line, his, his life was never the same. He was arrested. He was caught up in something that he didn't necessarily sign up for. He was arrested. And oftentimes people in history who make a big difference, they didn't necessarily sign up for it. They were simply being faithful in the moment and their life for thereafter was changed. Martin Luther King Jr., 26-year-old PhD student who was still working on his dissertation, landed in Montgomery, Alabama, the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church, across the mall from the governor's mansion. He literally could see the office window to Governor George Washington, George Wallace, a, a white supremacist then, like the one we have in the White House now. 
He put a he, he put a gonna be prophet across the mall from 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 a white supremacist. And then when Rosa Parks sat down on her seat, that was something that had been done commonly before. Many black people had been marched off to jail or dragged off the bus and summarily beaten. But on this occasion, Rosa Parks, a 42-year-old seamstress from a family who had long time been involved in civil rights, who was known not to hurt a fly, all the historical circumstances stacked up. So on that given day, she wasn't trying to start a movement. She just had a not today attitude. God can use somebody with a not today attitude. They said heroes of people get too tired, too cold, too hungry, and too afraid to care and do something that starts more than what they attended. Sometimes it's just not today. I know you love the Lord, but how many of you every now and then have a not today attitude? Not today. And on that given day, when that white man wanted her to give up and give her seat, when she had been on her feet all day long, it was like, look, do what you want to, but not today. Mm -mm. Hail to the opposite of heaven. No, 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 not today. And when they drug her off that bus, it hit a while. A gasoline was lying on the floor. And a Rosa Parks, that harmless, godly, pious woman dragged off that bus. The whole community said, not no more. And 50,000 black folks stood up and walked together. And when crabs in a barrel can walk together for 381 days... She was called and the rest of her life was different. And then a 26-year-old pastor was called to lead the movement. And the reason why Martin King was put up as the leader of the Montgomery Improvement Association was not because he had the longest resume. He had no resume. But all of the other preachers, like crabs in the barrel, they all had issues with one another. And he hadn't been in town long enough to have any enemies. So by default, he became the leader. God can take the foolish things of the world. So that we know that the excellency is of God and not us. He wanted to do you, he wanted to do lectures and be a traveling lecturer in universities and so forth and spend time in his office writing books. He had no intention of getting involved in a street movement, but he was arrested. He was called. He received an invitation that he wasn't looking for and decided to show up. You don't choose a calling, a calling chooses you. How many times have you been invited to become a part of something bigger than yourself that violated your well worked out plans for your life but you refused to show up because you wanted to keep your job and you rejected your calling. So you go to the job that you hate because you rejected your calling because you chose lifestyle over life purpose. You don't choose a calling calling chooses you. Hey, let's bring it a little bit closer. Y'all know Lan Osterlo? Y'all don't know Lan Osterlo? Lan Osterlo was the head of the Swedish uh, physicists who were trying to decide to develop something that would stem high blood pressure and cure balding for men. And so he developed this little blue pill, blue pill and then grabbed 100 men as part of a test group and told them, take one of these blue pills every day, come back in a month and tell me if anything grows. <laughs> they came back in a month. He said, did anything grow? He said, uh, yeah, but not on the head. And he developed Viagra. <laughs> bumped into it and he said after that when he saw the potential of this new drug that men who thought time and age had sidelined them forever in the love game could now with that little pill could get back in the game all the brothers in the house say amen say amen for the other brothers because I know you don't need it all the ladies in the house who got a man who uses the pill say hallelujah Come on, this is a mature audience. Ain't no kids at this service. Lan Osterley bumped into his calling for the rest of his life. He dedicated himself to improving the quality of the romance of, of, of mature people. He didn't sign up for that. And think about it when, when a calling chooses you. That um, Your third point is that a calling 
blows up everything that you had previously planned. One, uh, Gerhard von Rod says in, in his, his, his talking about the call of Abraham, he says that a calling, a true calling, disrupts, disjoints, and dislocates. Disrupts. He's what you were doing, disrupted it. Disjoints, separates you from some things, places, and people. Changes your address and your associations. Disrupts, disjoints, like knocking an arm out of joint and dislocates. In other words, a calling is not something you fit in to your prescriptions. You don't fit it in to what you are already doing. You don't do it if you find the time. You change your schedule. That's why some of y'all are lukewarm pew occupants. But not about any real ministry. Because you're trying to fit your Christian discipleship into your work schedule. Your work and your play schedule. As opposed to letting God take your schedule and throw it up in the air. And turn it upside down till you turn it right side up. And reschedule everything. And some things in your schedule are out forever. Because some things going to be in your schedule that life is going to revolve around differently. It blows everything up. And that's really what the, 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 when you look at Abraham's calling, sitting in Mesopotamia, that was the ancient trade route. Abraham was an affluent man who already had herds and ox and servants. He was a symbol of success by worldly terms. In that ancient culture, he was already a successful man. But then the Lord called him and said, get to Canaan. Leave Haran, get to Canaan. And he said, just walk out in the desert till I tell you to stop walking. Where to? Just walk out in the desert till I tell you to stop walking. He says, and Abraham believed God. It was counted unto him for righteousness. See, we live in a society featuring, at least mythically talking about upward mobility. We see success as going from rags to riches. But in the Bible, oftentimes, God calls people who have riches and calls them to endure rags. Paul says, I've suffered plenty and now I've suffered want. For the sake of the gospel, Moses left Egypt and went to Midian, came back with rags and a stick against the Pharaoh, but realized that the fight was not his, it was the Lord's. Paul left a comfortable place on the Sanhedrin, on the fast track to the Sanhedrin, and instead he became a poor pilgrim of the gospel, oftentimes shipwrecked and starving and hungry for the sake of the gospel, and bore in his body the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ when he was beaten and flogged and jailed. Abraham left a place of comfort for the discomfort of the wilderness because God was promising something more than himself. Oftentimes when God calls us, he calls us from people who are already successful in worldly terms and calls us to leave, release what the, our, our, our being tethered to what the world calls success to follow a calling. And that's what Paul is talking about here. Abraham leaving success for a calling because an invitation has gone out. A lot of people got it. But he's one of the few that accepted it and showed up. And think about Jeffrey Bezos, um, 45's friend. Or should I say nemesis? Because, you know, Jeffrey Bezos right now is considered the wealthiest man on the face of the planet. And, and 45 wants you to think he's wealthy. <laughs> he's probably the most in debt man on the face of the planet. And, um, but Jeffrey Bezos graduated Princeton University, success, with a degree in um, computer engineering, success. Started a job, worked various jobs on Wall Street, 1984 to 19. Uh, in 1986 to 1984, success became, in terms of his stock options and so forth, a, a millionaire, success. And they decided to do a road trip from New Jersey to Seattle. And, uh, and when he got here, he came up with the idea of doing an e-commerce for books, an online book. Went so well that he said, that since came in, come into the area, the front yard of the, of the, of the world's, uh, the global revolution in information technology where young cats named uh, 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 Paul Allen 
and, 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 and Steve Jobs, and of course the big guy, Bill Gates, um, the third, because his father is the second and the grandfather was the first. And uh, guys who had left the University of Washington, success, because they had the vision of putting a computer in every home and then through the computer, bring the world to everyone's fingertips. And Basil said, wait a minute. If Alan and Jobs and Gates can bring the world, the information of the world to everyone's fingertips, then I believe that I can bring the goods and services of the world to your doorstep. Right. <laughs> so that you ain't got to go to the mall anymore. <laughs> and, 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 and as a result of Bezos, now here's my issue with Bezos, he's killing malls because anchor tenants like Macy's and Penny's and Macy's formerly the Bon Marche, those of you under 40, Google Bon Marche when you get home, and, 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 and Nordstrom's and Sears, they are now closing stores because people are shopping online. People like my daughter Carissa are destroying malls because in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, they started doing these one-stop malls where they had ice skating rinks and movie theaters so the whole family could go to the mall and mom and daddy could go shop or somebody go to the movie, somebody go ice skating, spend the whole day at the mall, and now because of those anchor tenants are going online, malls are the mall cultures in about 10 years, malls are going to be all gone. And, and people that do, I told Chrissy, you're destroying my holiday experience of going to the malls. I'm not one of these cats who can shop online because I'm in between sizes. I, I have to try it on. I end up sending all my stuff back. So, so, so I don't like the fruits of Bezos, but I respect the fact that Bezos is a guy. He said that if they can bring the world to your fingertips with a computer, I can bring the goods and door services to your doorstep. And his income has topped $150 billion as the richest man in the world. Well, he also had the biggest divorce settlement, so it dropped down a little bit. But at $116 billion as of yesterday, I'm not feeling sorry for this cat. But here was a man who left success on Wall Street and, and, and opened a business in a garage. He was willing to go from success to less following a calling and the calling took him to even more success you see sometimes in the mathematics of God you got to subtract before you can add yeah. let me say that again sometimes in the mathematics of God you got to subtract before you can add but some of us we ain't, we ain't willing to lose nothing so we got closed fists don't lose nothing but it don't gain nothing and so we're living small then peanuts you holding on to may be nothing to the, 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 the crumbs you holding on to may be nothing compared to the loaf God really wants to give you if you would just trust him for the journey God won't any place God call you he can keep you that's what Harriet Tubman said if he called me he can keep me you need more than just a job. You need a call. He left a job because he felt he was called to change the way people shop and has changed the world. Didn't want a job. He had a calling. A calling. Difference between a calling and a job, fourthly, is that when you have a calling, you may get tired in the work, but you never get tired of the work. Let me say that again. Touch your neighbor and say, Pastor D today. <laughs> Preach, Pastor. I'm trying. <laughs> when you have a calling, you may get tired in the work, but you don't get tired of the work. Now, how many of y'all get tired of your job? None of y'all get tired of your job. <laughs> I never knew the choir could be this dishonest on Sunday morning. I hear y'all complaining about your jobs. Now let me put it this way. How many of y'all get tired of your kids? Now I really know you're lying. Anybody's ever raised kids, don't tell me you don't get tired of them kids. If you get tired of your kids, God knows you can get tired of your job. But here's the deal. When you are working in your calling, not just trying to make a living but you know why you were made to live. That the work will exhaust you because you're human. But a little bit of rest and you'll be renewed in the work. That's why the song says, I don't feel no ways tired. Don't mean I don't get tired, but the same work that exhausts me also recharges my battery. It's like starting a car when the, when, 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 the, the starter's not there. The starter's to kick over and, and, and then you run off, you, 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 
The battery gets the car started and then you run from the engine. And it recharges itself. The alternator, it runs and it recharges itself. If the alternator doesn't work and you just run it from the battery, the battery will run out and will not be renewed. And the reason why some of you guys suffer from burnout and your battery's being run down because you don't have an alternator that regenerates it. The calling is the regenerator. That's why whenever Paul got in a tough place, he said, I know the Lord has placed his hand on me. And that's what recharges me in spite of the darts, the arrows, the criticism, the lies, the rumors, the trifling people you have to work with, the broken promises. I see people every week. Rev, I'm going to see you on Sunday. I just went to my 20-year class, 40-year class reunion. And a guy, one of my friends, he's probably watching online now. Hey, Yubi. And he said, uh, he said, Rev, he told me last week, Rev, I'm going to be there Sunday. He didn't show up Sunday. He said, Rev, I'm going to be there Sunday. I said, you know what? You told me that at the 30-year reunion. You told me that at the 20-year reunion. You told me that at the 10-year reunion. 40 years later, Negro, you ain't showed up. You can get tired when you're dealing with broken promises, people dropping the ball, it will wear you out. Jesus got tired on a boat one day from one side of the Sea of Galilee to the other. When God became man and was subject to the frailties of the flesh, even God got tired in the work. But that same God, when they woke him up and there was a need at hand and they were questioning whether or not God cared, God woke up that I'm man enough to get tired. Oh, but wind, wave, and sea show them that I'm always on time. Sit down and be quiet. What manner of man is this? What manner of apostle is this? What manner of apostle could say I've been cast down but not destroyed? Troubled on every side but not in dismay. Perplexed but not in despair. This work will wear me out but it will not destroy me because the same work that exhausts me recharges my battery because I've been called. I'm not doing a job. I'm responding to an invitation. May leave rehearsal one day exhausted, but I'll be back next week. Oh, don't you? I may leave here exhausted. I'll be back next week. I may ride a mechanical bull and get a hernia. I may have to sit in a chair, but I'll be back here next week. Till the Lord take me, I don't feel no waste tired. Don't mean I don't get tired. I get tired in the work, but I ain't tired of the work. I ain't tired of preaching. I ain't tired of serving. I ain't tired of testifying. I ain't tired of visiting the sick. I ain't tired of going down to the jail to see about folks. That's why I'm alive. If you're sick of church, if you're sick of serving, it's because you got a job. But you don't have no sense of, you don't have no sense of calling. You don't have no sense of calling. You get tired in the work, but you don't get tired of the work. And one of the reasons why you don't get tired of the work, fifthly, and I'm going to sit on and get on out your way, is that when you are called, you realize, as it said in Romans 8, 28, where it's talking about calling, you realize that all things work together for good for them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. When you are called, you know up front that who called you is going to make the way, and so it's going to work out. Some are called, some are went, some just sent. If you just sent, if you just, some are called, some are sent, some just went. If you just went on your job, you don't know if it's going to work out because it's just you. But when the battle's not yours, it's the Lord's, and the Lord can't lose. It's too wise to make a mistake, too just to do any wrong, and too strong to ever be defeated. And I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me because it's not me, it's the Lord. And the work he's begun in me, he is able to complete it. See, I'm, 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 really, I'm really mad with Marvel Comics because of the way that they, the way that they just punked out the Incredible Hulk in their last two movies. They, they just punked out the Incredible Hulk in Infinity Wars and in Endgame. Just punked him out. First of all, first of all, when, when, when Hulk was slapped up by Thanos in the last one and didn't literally refuse to come out and play the rest of the movie, that's just not the Hulk. He literally refused to Hulk for the rest of the movie. Then when he came back in Endgame, they had a, a hybrid Hulk somewhere between Bruce Banner and the Incredible Hulk. The Incredible Hulk does not wear a sweater. <laughs> and have a cup of coffee in Starbucks and smile. No such thing as no kinder, gentler Hulk. The Hulk is who you call at the last instance because he's going to come out and win the battle, but he's going to tear everything up in the process. 
That's the incredible hope. And what makes gives him his special powers is that he's mad as the opposite of heaven. And the matter you make him, the stronger he gets. And you can shoot your bullets and your bombs, but everything you throw at him simply causes him to get madder and makes him stronger. So the stuff you throw at him to kill him, it don't kill him, it makes him stronger because it takes it in. So no matter what, no matter what you throw at him, it just makes it don't kill him, it makes him stronger. The incredible hope. That's why hope can't lose because everything you try to kill him just makes the Hulk stronger. And that's the way it is for you and I when we got a call. Everything you throw at us just makes us stronger. Have I got a witness? Talk about us. Just makes us stronger. Put us down. Just makes us stronger. It's like Jesus put nails in his hand, drive spikes in his feet, put a crown of thorns on his brow, stab him in the side, put him in a tomb, but come back Sunday morning. The itinerant preacher has become the savior of the world with all power in heaven and earth in my hand. If you can knock us down, but you can't stop God from picking us up. You can cast us out, but God will take us in. You can stand against me, but God is standing for me. Why? Because I was called. It's not a job. It's a charge to keep and a cross to glorify. I've been called. I've been called. Touch your neighbor. Say, I've been called. I've been called. That's why I'm still preaching. I've been called. That's why you ought to keep singing. You've been called. That's why you ought to keep serving. You've been called. That's why you ought to keep giving. You've been called. That's why you ought to keep shouting. You've been called. That's why you ought to keep praising them. You've been called. Hey, hey, hey. Good days and bad days I've been called good times and bad times I've been called sickness or well I've been called I know that the Lord has placed his hand on me say yeah say yeah I know I know who I am and what I'm to do because of who I am it ain't no job it is a calling say yeah 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 what is your calling what's your calling have you let that job keep you from your calling? Have you been so afraid of having less? You cut off your pathway to more. Have you been so busy making a living? You haven't allowed yourself to discover why you were made to live. We've all received the invitation, many were called. But relative to how many received the invitation, only a few have actually accepted it and showed up. Maybe today is your day to show up. Obviously you're here, so you're not like those who blow off the invitation totally, but maybe you're like the person in the parable who showed up but not dressed. And the whole armor of God and the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith blessed bread of righteousness feet shod with the gospel of peace and the sword of the spirit maybe showed up in a way that was still offensive to God showing up with something other than the Lord on your mind either way you haven't accepted the invitation a church full of folks who have no sense of calling simply not a congregation but an aggregation of thin-skinned, lukewarm, pew occupants think like spectators and consumers to consume what other people are doing and a spectator to judge the performance. You're not here to judge my performance because I'm not performing. And if I were, I wouldn't perform for you. The question is, have you discovered why you were made to live have you found that thing that is reason enough to get out of bed in the morning? Whether it's sunshine or rain, 
drives you through the day. And even when you get tired, it revives your soul again. Something for which when you close your eyes, the last time you can say, it was worth it. It was worth it. That's what the Lord is saying to the church today. Put in your name. I, Leslie David Braxton, called to be by the will of God. So now you say that sentence and put your name in it. I, Dotsy Isom, called to be, fill it in, by the will of God. Play that sentence out in your mind. I, James Clemson, called to be, by the will of God. Can you finish that sentence? If you can't, you need to be about the process today of seeking till you find, knocking till the door is open and asking until it is given. That's what you need to be looking for. Because only then will you be able to say, I don't feel no waste time. Because you'll probably get sick of the job out there and the job you got in here. When you and your calling, you may get tired in it, but you won't get tired of it. Doors of the church are open. He's waiting for somebody to accept the invitation. Jesus is calling. Jesus is calling. Waiting. Is waiting for you. I want to tell you he's waiting.